Hello, and welcome to this edition of The Collaborative Corner. I'm Brianna Barrow. And I'm Zach Bernard. We're your hosts of The Collaborative Corner, and we're happy to have you with us here today. The Collaborative Corner is a production of the Fort Wayne Media Collaborative, with the goal of connecting listeners to the stories and culture of Northeast Indiana. Through this podcast, we want to bring you the full context of our region by speaking with notable people in local government, entertainment, food, you name it. And joining us for today's episode, we're talking with the director of the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics, Michael Wolf. The Mike Down Center is part of the Centers of Excellence at Purdue University, Fort Wayne. It's Indiana's first nonpartisan center dedicated to helping Hoosiers understand the far-reaching impact of politics in their everyday lives. Named in honor of Mike Downs, the center stands as a testament to his legacy of teaching and commitment to civic engagement. The center plays a critical role in guiding our understanding of public policy, political history, and current events. And today we have the unique opportunity to hear and gain insight from Michael Wolf, one of the most anticipated events in American politics, the upcoming 2024 presidential election. Michael, thank you for joining us sure, today. Sure, it's great to be here. The results of the 2024 election are going to impact Hoosiers in a variety of ways. How would each candidate's agenda shape the economic opportunities and quality of life for individuals in Indiana? Well, I think it's going to be uh, big because they, they go in different directions. They have different philosophies. Uh, and, uh, you know, some to Indiana being both a big agricultural state and a big manufacturing state means that there's quite a blend of things going on. Uh, you know, Indiana has benefited directly uh, from the CHIPS Act and some of the other things that the Biden-Harris administration has put into place. Um, and we'll see, because Indiana did well, you know, financially uh, relative to some of its neighbors throughout the whole um, span of both of those sets of presidencies. So it's hard to determine exactly what will happen, but um, I think we do need to look at trade policy. Indiana has obviously seen Governor Holcomb uh, put a, a lot of work into trade agreements and trade missions. That uh, That's an important thing to keep, in, uh, keep focus on when we talk about uh, potentially raising tariffs and other things like that. How will that influence the, the state's goal of increasing some of their manufacturing base and agricultural basis? Got it. Uh, recent surveys from Pew Research show that inflation, the lack of bipartisan cooperation, and the affordability of health care are among top issues facing Americans, with more than half of the public viewing these as very big problems. Given these concerns, how do you think the focus on these issues will play out in the presidential election? Well, I think inflation is kind of baked in, and that's we see this around the world. This 2024 is actually the, the most elections and the most people doing elections around the world at any point in history. And what we've seen from the trend so far is a frustration of uh, people with incumbents, largely. And that probably has to do with high levels of inflation overall. And that is uh, certainly something that uh, works against incumbents and uh, makes it difficult. Uh, when we talk about bipartisan cooperation, we start to enter a, a separate kind of, uh, and maybe the, as we've seen recently, the, the push by Kamala Harris to kind of talk about, um, we need a new way of moving things instead of beating down the other side. Uh, that's probably touching on that second point you talked about, about the bipartisan agreement. I imagine as um, the debate moves forward and the debates uh, happen, we're going to see more and more kind of a focus on uh, the, a style of politics that, that's important that I think will be kind of key. What impact do you see each candidate's platform having towards Hoosiers that work in manufacturing and agriculture? Yeah, I think that this is uh, really big because we also have issues that aren't necessarily at the federal level, like uh, property taxes and other things that are very much affecting things. Like I said, I think the tariff uh, debate and how that goes um, uh, will be important. I'd like to see how members of Congress and senators running, if they're echoing the same kind of uh, tariff um, um, notion that uh, President Trump has been pushing. Uh, and I think that will have a, a big kind of component uh, because when, once you start raising tariffs, the, uh, the economists would say the tariffs will start leading. And agriculture usually is one of the main drivers of protectionism overall. We certainly see that in the European context and in, in the American context at some point. But it's noteworthy that um, I think there's a lot more agreement in some of these areas than what we would have expected given, as we said, the kind of polarized and not working together. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, trade with China 
uh, the Biden administration kept on some of those tariffs, and certainly Kamala Harris hasn't suggested she would remove some of the tariffs put on, particularly for electric vehicles and some of these primary uh, aspects, uh, the investment in chips and other kind of uh, important, uh, and American Steel, as uh, has been noted by both of them, uh, the, the kind of worry about U.S. Steel being sold uh, to uh, Japanese companies. So I think there's a lot of commonality in some of these uh, overall uh, frameworks, as we'll see some of the, uh, the issues like property taxes and home affordability. I think Kamala Harris is developing some plans uh, as far as uh, tax reduction for um, uh, down payments and some of the first time uh, uh, homeowners that already the federal government is uh, pretty aggressive at helping with, but uh, certainly will add uh, some fuel to hopefully kickstart, in, in her case, uh, what that is. I think in large part the Trump administration will point backward and say, look how things were prior to COVID, and that's what we would like to return to. Whether or not that manifests itself in uh, explicit policies is a different issue. Given the challenges of crime, immigration, and political gridlock, which candidate do you think has a stronger message for Hoosiers on public safety and bipartisan cooperation? Yeah, and I think this goes in different directions. Um, a large part of you know the public safety component, and we saw this in the gubernatorial actual primary races, had to deal with the border, immigration, fentanyl, and all this. So, so this is top of mind to a lot of voters because it's been framed and kind of primed for the voters uh, given what they saw last May in the run up to that. Uh, primary election. So I think people's perception of the immigration is, is very much uh, public safety oriented at this point. Um, and so I think Donald Trump has uh, an advantage there and Republicans often have advantage when it comes to public safety. And so if that ends up being some uh, kind of the issue that drives things, it's certainly going to uh, b probably benefit uh, Donald Trump a little bit. Now, that's not to say Democrats are going to come over. They, they see this issue differently, certainly, and will point to uh, some of the actions by the, uh, the Biden-Harris administration at the border recently. But um, that's, uh, but it cuts in a different direction as, as far as the polarization and bipartisanship. I think, again, uh, the tone that you see that hasn't really been, because she's only been in the race so, so far, has been to, to suggest that there's a reset button and the style of politics has to change. And so that might work a little bit more toward the bipartisan kind of component of that. Interesting. Okay. Indiana's voter turnout is typically among the lowest in the country, yet you can always count on certain folks to vote every single election. What can the Harris and Trump campaigns do to boost engagement and turnout ahead of the 2024 election? Yeah, they could come. You know, they could do put some effort in. Um, what we've seen, Indiana is actually declining too. It's not just that we're lowest. It's that we've been going down, and that's unfortunate. Um, so at the presidential election, you know, there's zero investment and hasn't been since 2008 in Indiana, and that's really unfortunate, I think, um, and it's a product of kind of perverse incentives that the Electoral College provides uh, uh, candidates to just focus on literally a state, uh, you know, next door that is very like Fort Wayne in so many ways and like our general area. Um, but that's, you know, I think there's, there is energy. Uh, polarization, like it or not, um, does bring a certain level of voter turnout. We saw that in 2020. Um, and the fact that Indiana isn't really a showdown state probably is indicative of why we have a little bit of a lower voter turnout. And then statewide elections haven't been as competitive in recent cycles either, which also then adds to less of a, uh, a kind of turnout effect that, that you would get as things get closer. There are voters, as you noted, that do turn out. Mm -hmm. And um, these are voters tending to be in tight communities, typically rural areas that uh, really rely more on civic duty. And there's a sense of uh, socialization of that. But what we see in suburban and larger cities is competition really ends up driving uh, the impetus to vote for people. And that obviously has been a little bit down given the president's uh, presidential elections don't really end up being uh, pursued much to be competitive. And then the statewide have been a little bit less competitive in recent cycles. 
With the rise of misinformation surrounding elections, what steps do you think need to be taken to ensure election security and integrity? Uh, and how can voters in Indiana better you know, inform themselves and safeguard themselves against false information? Listen to this podcast. I mean, I think that's <laughs> uh, one. I mean, what, what we see is patterns around, um, around the country is that when local media fails, it opens up a lot of, it's a vacuum that gets filled with um, uh, national level information. And with the kind of disintegration of mainstream media into multiple different sources, which is great for podcasts, uh, but there are podcasts that are not as good as you guys, that are less informative or uh, disinformation, you know. Uh, and so that vacuum of the lack of lo local media has been directly tied to some of the really kind of negative components of polarization uh, that uh, mean that people don't empathize with each other because they don't know anything about each other. Their information stream uh, and the flow of information isn't what it used to be where local media used to contextualize. So this is very important that um, people pursue I, you know, clearly the, the, the solid media sources we have locally that um, the collaborative is part of, you know, that seek those out. We're really lucky, and I don't think we understand that in this local area to have such strong and collaborative media sources that, um, that do provide good context. Uh, the fact that we had a mayoral election last year that was lacked food fighting and, and, all the, and it was very information and policy based, I think is a benefit um, to the candidates that ran and to the media who, who framed things in a really contextualized way. Uh, so I think it's hard to do. I think certainly public media um, and, and other sources like that, the newspaper, uh, good local television programs, uh, and this podcast like this are really important for people. And it's hard to do. It's hard to cut through because there's a lot of junk on the way to get there. That's true. Well, we appreciate you saying that. Well, I appreciate uh, you guys doing it. Yeah, thank so. you so much for speaking with us today, Mike. Is there sure. anything else you want to say? No, I mean, uh, getting out the vote takes people have, getting informed, uh, doing some work. You have a couple months here, uh, and so hopefully the outlets like this can, can really break through. So Thank you. You bet. Thank you, and we'd also like to thank the Fort Wayne Media Collaborative Project Manager, Dave Goff, for coordinating this episode of the show for us. Also, our thanks to the College TV staff at the Center for Collaborative Media here at Purdue University, Fort Wayne. If you're interested in more information and more content from the Fort Wayne Media Collaborative, please visit fwmediacollaborative.com. Until next time, I'm Zach Bernard. And I'm Brianna Barrow. Thank you for listening.